Hello, welcome to the 10-minute wrap-up for uh, Skyline Biology, um, Biology 215 with Nick Cap. I am today going to talk to you a little bit about ecosystems and restoration uh, restoration ecology. Again, remember this is a wrap-up, and we're gonna, just going to go through this really quick. Uh, we will hopefully cover some of the physical laws that govern our ecosystems, and the, um, talk about the limiting factors that control uh, production of ecosystems. And remember, we talked about this in populations as well. We'll also talk about energy transfer between the different trophic levels, nutrient cycles, and um, some of the highlights of restoration ecology. Basically, you guys are going to be going on this one on, on your own. An ecosystem is basically all the organisms in the community plus the abiotic factors. That is everything else. It's basically looking at everything in roughly a small to a large area. Uh, we'll talk about transformations of energy and matter and talk about energy flow and chemical cycling. Um, to that extent, you had a picture very similar to this, and basically most of the energy that we get on our um, planet comes from the sun in the form of sunlight. Our primary producers um, convert it into chemical bond energy and their bodies, and from there it goes on to, to the rest. We know by the conservation of energy that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It's only transformed so that that sunlight energy um, has to be converted into something else. And again, even that energy that's used up by um, sugar um, using up some kinetic energy, again, that's only a transformation. Conformation of mass is the same thing. Uh, when organisms go to the bathroom, it has to go somewhere. Uh, again, ecosystems are open systems absorbing energy and mass and releasing heat and waste products. And uh, these go out into the environment, and we did talk about that a little bit. Uh, we did talk about global uh, net primary production. Uh, this here is kind of looking at the kilograms of carbon per meter per year, and we see the most um, productive areas are in the tropics because they are getting the most sunlight and they are getting the most water. Again, in areas where we have those 30-degree uh, gyres, uh, where we're not getting a lot of water, we have these desert areas here that we don't see very much productivity. Again, depending on the year, the poles don't get that much sun, and again, they don't have the temperature. Um, again, while the oceans, uh, for the most part, are not as productive as like the rainforest is, um, because there's so much more ocean than there are these productive rainforests, I would say that uh, the vast majority of the net productivity is um, from the uh, oceans. Uh, again, in terrestrial systems that uh, we looked at, we don't, we're not looking that much on the ocean. Uh, things that greatly affect how organisms grow is the temperature, the moisture, and the soil nutrients. And this slide here is looking at net primary production versus annual um, precipitation. And, and again, there's a, a little bit of a, 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 a limit on that. Um, not all energy in food will result in growth. And so a classic example of that is this picture that we have right here. And so when the plant material that's eaten by the caterpillar may equal 200 joules, I don't know why they do 200, about 50% of food is really not digestible. So this plant here has lots of cellulose and possibly some lignin and stuff like that. And this, um, uh, for the most part, this organism here doesn't have a symbiotic relationship to get that. And so, again, when this caterpillar eats through this leaf material, a lot of feces is left over, and a lot of that feces is not assimilated into the energy of this organism. Of this organism, only roughly about 33, roughly about 10%, 15%, 10% is incorporated into the body of this organism. The rest of it comes out in respiration. That is, this organism has a cost to moving and walking and chewing, digesting, having sex and breathing and kind of everything else. And so that what it basically nets uh, ends up if in uh, only about 10 to 15 percent of food energy is actually used uh, in growth. So let's say 10 percent. Um, when we talk about uh, trophic efficiency, um, we will see that every time we go up a trophic level or a feeding level, that we're basically losing 10%. So you go up one, two, three, up to the tertiary consumers, there's very little energy left in there for those particular um, individuals. So that's one of the reasons why we tend to not have levels of many, many trophic levels. How can this be applied to people? Again, we look at it here. If we human beings are sec going to be secondary consumers and eat cows or pork or chicken, we realize that we're going to lose most of the nutrient value of the corn or whatever primary production producing crop that we have 
to the respiration and the maintenance of our cattle. Whereas if we humans were a little bit more on the vegetarian side, then uh, we would be able to support more human, human beings. Um, geochemical cycles. Um, this is a, a graph uh, that I really like a lot, and it talks about the four different reservoirs that we have of, of basically uh, chemicals. And uh, uh, so uh, basically what's going on here is, is these two chemicals right here, um, well, basically we have a reservoir of, of organisms that, that nutrients are held up, nutrients and elements are held up in living things those materials can get fossilized when they're covered up by uh, soil and pulled out for a very long time. They can fossilize. When we burn these fossils, we make these nutrients available um, um, to, uh, to us being able to take them up again. Uh, Again, uh, the inorganic materials and available as, min, uh, as, as, as nutrients that are not naturally in the soil can be weathered out. And so, again, be able to talk about how nutrients move through each of these um, uh, reservoirs. Um, hopefully, most of you are aware of the water um, cycle. Uh, again, how does water get onto land? It sunlight causes it to evaporate. It goes into moisture into air, which then moves onto the land, and some conditions change. Either that air goes up higher and cools off, or it cools off here. Or we see enough of a nucleation that that air goes into the soil and it percolates into the soil. When that air, uh, when that um, basically that pure water goes through the air and goes through the soil and and, and rocks, it actually picks up n mineral uh, nutrient content. It doesn't get salty, it's still fresh, but it does pick up that nutrient uh, content. Carbon cycle is a big one that we talked about. Uh, again, the interesting thing about carbon is that it does, it is a, a major greenhouse gas in, in the air. Um, the nitrogen cycle, uh, we talked a little bit about no, the nitrogen cycle. And uh, again, one of the things that we have done is, is, uh, is human beings have to do a process called industrial fixation. So many of our crops actually use artificial fertilizers in order in order to run. The second cycle that um, uh, actually in the, in the nitrogen cycle and the carbon dioxide cycle, both of these uh, have the, 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 the elements and the nutrients are able to move very readily through the atmosphere. Whereas in the phosphorus cycle, um, basically this is present as dissolved minerals in water or in the, the rocks. So in the phosphorus cycle, we can actually have many areas locally that are starved for phosphorus because just there is no phosphorus ar around. Um, Again, uh, the Hubbard book study, if you could take a look at that study, basically what they did is they took a number of valleys uh, uh, next to their school and they did various things. Basically, they measured the amount of nutrients going in and they measured the amount of nutrients going out very quickly. And they realized that when they deforested, they cut down this forest and just let it sit there, that um, many of the nutrients came out. Yet, many of the nutrients did not come out when the forest was there. So forests are very good at um, um, keeping their nutrients. Um, your book also talks about restoration um, uh, biology, and I think this is a, a, a big area of uh, basically hiring people like yourselves who know about biology. And in this area here, you take, basically take what's called primary succession, an area where basically there's just gravel. We see some um, uh, we see some plants here, but but not a lot, and not a lot is going to grow in here because basically there's no soil. And so what you can do is you can go in and you can plant, uh, put some soil, uh, plant some. Um, um, uh, uh, pioneer species, etc., and then relatively soon you'll get something that um, um, looks uh, inhabited. Uh, again, some of the restoration projects that I would look up and uh, be a little bit more aware of are the Kissimmee River in Florida, where there, um, uh, this river was channelized and they're, they're, they're releasing into the channel. They kind of done the same thing with the Rhine River in, in Europe, the Truckee River in Nevada, which was, was uh, kind of the same thing. Um, so be aware.